Hey everybody, welcome back to the Dungeon Dive. Daniel here. All right, and welcome to the year-end review for uh, 2021. Uh, this is going to be a long video, so uh, just sit back, relax, and enjoy it. I was thinking about splitting it up into multiple parts, but um, I don't want to do that. I want to have everything uh, grouped together, everything just in one long video. So we're going to be kind of taking a look back at 2021. Uh, looking at the games we covered, some of the highlights from that. Uh, we're going to be going over some uh, questions that were posed to me from the Dungeon Dive patrons. We're going to be looking forward to 2022. And then we're going to end out the video with a little bit of a, a best of awards type thing. Uh, nothing extravagant, nothing uh, big, not a full top 10. But we're going to be taking a look at some of the best things that I experienced this year. Uh, 2021 was another pretty interesting year in the uh, history of uh, humankind, I would say. Um, what a, yeah, what a year. 2020, 2021. Um, I'm wondering if we're ever going to live in less interesting times again. Who knows? Uh, but I am looking forward to, to those less interesting times. That is for sure. Uh, but yeah, it's been a pretty good year on the Dungeon Dive, and um, I did make a list of, I think, all of the games I covered, at least all of the games that I made an individual video for. I know there was a couple videos I did, like the small box video, the small games video, where I covered a whole bunch of games in one video. I didn't list all of those out here, but um, in really no particular order, the games that we covered this year. Uh, Heroes of Tenefer, Journey to the Overland, Waste Knight 2nd Edition, Secrets of the Lost Tomb. We did the Masterclass series on that, the second Dungeon Dive Masterclass series. So Secrets of the Lost Tomb has joined Warhammer Quest Silver Tower as the only two games so far in the Dungeon Dive Masterclass series. Uh, Adventure Tactics, Quest Calendar, Champions of Hara, Bloodborne, a Touch of Evil, Sleeping Gods, Dark Darker Darkest, Defenders of the Last Stand, Quest for the Lost Pixel, Iron Helm, Rogue Dungeon, Dungeon of D, History Maker Golf, uh, one of these things is not like the other, uh, <laughs> Dauber's Quest for the Key, Alone Against Fear, Dungeons of Infinity, Dark Venture, Hero's Journey Home, Explore it. Um, we did the Sands of Shurox and the Valley of the Dead King. We covered extensively Shadows of Brimstone and started our extensive coverage of War Against Darkness. Uh, Dungeon Crusade, Crypt of Chaos, Dream Wars, Colossal, Adventure Realms, Twisted Fate, Rocky Mountain Man, various solo RPG stuff, uh, and that, that whole series of videos. We looked at a whole bunch of stuff focusing on Scarlet Heroes and uh, D100 Dungeon with the World Builder and Ghosts Betwixt, which I have set up on the table right now because I'm still learning the game and I want to get that played. Unfortunately, I'm not going to be able to probably get a review in by the end of the year and I did not get to play it at all, so it's not going to be featured and um, it's not going to be it's not going to qualify for any kind of uh, best of award or anything this year i'll probably hold that over to next year but yeah that was a lot we did end up covering lots and that doesn't even count all of the books that we covered and the books kind of took um, a bigger part of the channel this year so uh just kind of like looking back on the year i think my favorite thing i did was the solo rpg series I had a lot of fun doing that and it was difficult to get into for me but i'm glad i did and i'm kind of glad i i broke that ice so now it's going to be easier and i'm going to revisit solo rpg things more often um, another thing i really liked doing that shadows of brimstone series because that is one thing that i really wanted the dungeon dive to be kind of like a digital museum and I love just showing everything about that game that I have. And that was a lot of fun. And it's, I think those videos have become my most watched uh, videos on the Dungeon Dive. At least as a group. 
Uh, dig diving into the Four Against Darkness series has been a ton of fun, and I am looking forward to getting back to that series because we still have a lot to cover. So yeah, it was really good. And one of my favorite things I did this year was really kick off, uh, properly kick off the Sword and Sorcery Saga series. Uh, starting to look at a lot of old Sword and Sorcery fiction, Sword and Planet, and Appendix N fiction. And uh, that has been a lot of fun and I am really looking forward to diving even deeper into those books and that realm in 2022. So one of the things that I did start was a thing called, I'm calling it the Appendix D. It's a takeoff on the Appendix N, of course, the famous Appendix in Dungeons and Dragons, talking about all the books that influenced uh, Gygax and the creation of D&D. So I started a thing called the Appendix D, which I am filling out, listing, trying to list all of the books that I've covered on the Dungeon Dive. And when I covered them with a link to the video and a little short synopsis slash capsule review type thing. And I'm making that um, as, a, as an award for Dungeon Dive um, patrons. So that's kind of a new award that I've started. Uh, I just started filling out the Appendix D, so it's going to be a slow process. But as time grows, I think it's going to be a really useful reference and a source for people to go to to see the kinds of books I like, the kinds of books that I've read that influence, that have also influenced my love for games. And um, so that I'm really happy to be able to offer that to the Dungeon Dive patrons. And it's fun for me to put together. And speaking of the uh, Dungeon Dive patron, let's go into some questions. So I asked the patrons if they had any questions for me. And I got a few. So um, I'm just going to go ahead and start. So let's see. Uh, Brian asks, um, Games that surprised you, disappointed you, and what games you are most looking forward to next year? And Christina asked, uh, maybe your top five or ten games in terms of gameplay story. Um, both of those questions are going to be answered in part four of this video. So uh, stay tuned for that. We will go over both of those in detail. Um, JS, JS has some interesting questions a little bit more general about like YouTube and stuff. So he says uh, he's interested in the day in the life of a board gamer on YouTube. Well, these, so I'm going to try to answer your questions, but keep in mind that this is really just kind of a very, very part time hobby for me. In addition to all of my other part time hobbies and my day job. So my answers are going to be a whole lot different than somebody's like shut up and sit down or the dice tower, which they do this full time, all the time, devote their entire lives to it. For me, it's a small fraction of my life. So he asks, uh, do you play games outside of your channel? Yes. I have a small group of friends that I've known for up here um, in the Seattle area for uh, 15 years or so, and we've played games together. Uh, luckily for me, one of my uh, buddies, he has like five times as many games as I do, and they're all kind of like Euro and more uh, less um, thematic style games. And so anytime we want to play one of those kinds of games, well, uh, he has it and we can play that. We haven't been getting together as often because a lot of my friends started having kids, unfortunately. Nah, just kidding. Uh, unfortunately for our time to be able to spend together. But um, we still try to get together every once in a while and, and, and we do play games. And there are a couple guys that I do play um, these kinds of games with. But we're going to talk a little bit about that in just a minute. Um, uh, what is the hardest thing you find when it comes to creating a video that will, that will appeal to everybody and at the same time trying to enjoy your game while filming? So I try not to think about pleasing everybody. I try not to think about really pleasing anybody except myself and being happy with the video that I make. It does influence the way I play games though quite a bit. Because when I make a video for a game, I usually like to make a video in the middle of a game, a few turns in. 
because I like to talk about the state of the board at a certain time. I think that's when a game is most interesting to discuss and to see when I show things on camera. Showing an end game can look really messy and you don't really get the sense of like how a game is progressing. You can tell the story of the game, but I like to see the game at a midpoint and then I can display or um, show a couple turn examples, something like that. Um, he follows up with, I know that uh, you usually don't make let's play videos, and I don't, and I do more session reviews, which I do. Um, but other than that, do you conceptualize your gameplay differently when you know it's going to end up on YouTube? Yes, so yeah, I just answered that. Yeah, most definitely. Um, it, does com it does very much change the way I do play games. Would you like, I would like to know a little bit more about the behind the scenes. What's it, what is it like for you to create and manage a YouTube channel? Uh, what do you like and dislike most about it? It's very time consuming. Um, I, I, yeah, no doubt about that. I do sometimes wonder if I would be into this hobby as much as I am if I didn't have the YouTube channel. That is to say, I'm not sure which is driving which at this point are my games, my love for games, my love for collecting games, is that driving the YouTube channel or is the YouTube channel driving my desire to collect and play games? It's a weird relationship and I'm not quite sure. If I was a betting man, I would say that if I stopped the dungeon dive, I would definitely spend less time on board games when I have free time to devote to my hobbies, I would probably revert back to spending more time making music and more time reading. Even though I do love this hobby, in the hierarchy of my hobbies, it is ranked pretty low. If I had to give up one hobby, it would be board games. And I know that's weird to say for a guy who has a YouTube channel devoted to board games, but for me, um, books and music are a much higher priority for a number of reasons. One, well, music, because so much of it is digital these days, it doesn't take up any space at all. And I, I love listening to music and I can listen to music anywhere I go constantly, you know, out and about. And... Um, books are just such an important part of my life that I just, I can't imagine like never reading books or, or being into books. And I have friends who we intensely discuss fiction with. So games, they take up a lot of time. A lot of effort goes into storing games, learning games, getting them to the table. It's just, it's a huge time sink of a hobby. And I get a lot of these itches that these games scratch scratched by video games which are a little easier to to control as a hobby that's not to say that i dislike these games or anything but honestly like that's kind of like where where i'm at so i'm not sure about my position in 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 the hobby the thing i dislike most about doing the youtube channel is the um is the really kind of just derogatory and hateful comments that I always have to delete to be to be perfectly frank. Um, I calculated it out recently that with the Dungeon Dive uh, Patreon and the number of hours I spend, you know, learning games, reading, um, reviewing, writing, editing, that I make about 10 cents an hour uh, <laughs> doing this hobby. And that is not enough money for me to put up with any amount of uh, BS. And I try to not even engage anymore with people who are just mean. I just delete the comment and ban them from the channel. And unfortunately, I have found that the most, the videos where I have to ban and delete the most are my sword and sorcery book videos. And those get the fewest views by far, like 10 times fewer views than my board game videos. But the comments there, oh my God, you guys. Sword and Sorcery fans are really fragile people. They make, um, they make 
Mr. Glass look like the Hulk, okay? Uh, <laughs> I have spent many decades of my life and a huge, huge percentage of my life's earnings collecting sword and sorcery, sword and planet, vintage science fiction, and old fiction in general. Um, just so much time, effort, and money has been put into my book collection. And I love my books. I love them dearly. I love sword and sorcery fiction. I love sword and planet fiction. I love old pulp fiction and old weird fiction, warts and all. But there is this segment of fans of that, those particular kinds of books, who think that any kind of criticism is somebody telling somebody not to read the books. Okay, if I'm doing a video on a book, there's a huge chance that I am encouraging people to read that book. Almost never will I do a video on a book where uh, I will tell somebody not to read it unless it's just a terrible book. And I'm really not going to do a review for a terrible book because I don't read terrible books. If I'm not enjoying a book, I stop reading it. I'm a huge um, proponent of quit early, quit often when it comes to reading. If I'm not liking a book 50 pages in, I stop reading it and I'm not going to do a video on it. But we need to discuss problematic things in the fiction we read, in the things we enjoy. And because I have some younger viewers and maybe some people coming to that style of fiction, that old pulp fiction for the first time through my channel, I need to tell them what they can expect in certain, in, from certain things about that kind of fiction. And I don't want them to think that I am endorsing the misogyny, endorsing the racism, endorse, endorsing the colonialism. Um, because if I'm not careful, people can think that, that I am endorsing that by not mentioning it. And that is something that happens all of the time especially on YouTube. So just mentioning those facts, just discussing those facts is not me in any way saying, don't read this fiction. It is me saying, hey, read this fiction, but just know what you're going to get into. Maybe put yourself in a different frame of mind and think about things and let's have an intelligent discussion after you've read it. We have had some intelligent discussions on those elements on the dungeon dive, but all too often it's just somebody calling me a name and somebody telling me I'm a pansy in other languages or other words i should say so okay that's, that was a really long tangent but thank you js those were really good questions um andy lennon our good friend andy lennon uh, on the dungeon dive facebook group and, and uh, patreon and he is going to be mentioned uh, much later in the video but he says our uh, personal highlights of the year those unplanned gaming moments that stuck with you be it a narrative twist an unexpected result or a memorable interaction or anything that really resonated. One thing that really resonated with me on a narrative level, and I really can't wait to get back to this game, and that is um, Ether Fields. So Ether Fields really impressed me on a narrative level. And for me, it was one of the first games I've ever played where I really feel like it is about something beyond the game. And I did just last week spend about an hour and a half resetting my game because it's kind of a legacy game and i haven't had a lot of time to devote to that game that is another thing that is hard about running a youtube like this is that i kind of need to keep games cycling i only have one table i only have one small hobby room and so it's hard to keep one game set up and so these long campaign games they don't get a lot of attention on the channel because I kind of have to keep working through other things and bringing new things to make videos for. And so I kind of lament that fact that I was not able to dive really deeply into Ether Fields and, and finish that story, but I, I am going to. That is one of my priorities in the next year or so to, to play through the entirety of that. Uh, game, uh, my favorite games that I've never covered on the channel um what haven't i covered yet that i want to i know uh, myth for one is a game that i want to do a series on i would say that that is the best i just said it this morning I, and this is kind of like my quote about uh, myth is that is the best game i wouldn't wish on my worst enemy 
I do want to do a longer series. One thing I really like is our Fabled Lands, the game book series. I know I've talked a little bit about those. Um, any other favorite games that I haven't discussed yet? I'm sure there are, but I can't think of any offhand. Just trying to look around here. Yeah, that's about it. I'm trying to think of any other like surprise experiences. Um, I don't really have anything off offhand. You guys have seen maybe the, you know, the the best of the surprise. <laughs> of the surprises if i'm when i'm going through a list maybe i'll come up with something and then a blue uh blue botic he says that i would be interested to hear any evolving thoughts you have on the dungeon crawler genre hobby in general do you still find pure joy in it or is there a feeling of diminishing returns as you play more and more dungeon crawlers okay that's a really interesting question um I'm going to read the rest of his and his questions because I think they all kind of relate. Um, he says, are dungeon crawlers headed in a good or interesting direction? Or has the genre sort of maxed out in its potential? Have we hit late stage dungeon crawlerism? Um, are they getting too big? Are, or is this a golden age of the hobby? Is this uh, space just too big to make any generalizations about? And to JS's point, does your channel feel your love for the hobby or drain it a bit? I kind of already talked about that. And how does the channel affect your gaming? I talked about that. So, I think we're past... Per, so predictions are always impossible. I'm just going to tell you my predictions that I think right now. Um, they are somewhat informed, but I'm not an insider. I think we're past peak dungeon crawl. I think we, we've reached that. I think the days of huge multi-box kickstarter games with an abundance of plastic are not at an end but are coming to an end i think we're going to start seeing fewer and fewer of those and that is because of a couple of very just logistical reasons one the cost to manufacture these games is getting astronomical two the cost of shipping these games is starting to dwarf the cost of manufacturing these games and it is very hard for creators to make any money on these big games it is really hard for me to store and learn these big games and when i see a big kickstarter box come i know a huge box that has multiple boxes inside it i feel more stress and anxiety than I do joy. I used to feel a lot of joy about that, but now it fills me with stress because I don't know where I'm gonna put it. I have a very small house, I have a very small hobby room. You know, this wall behind me and some space over there and a little tiny bit of space in my closet are the only spaces I have to store games. I have games in the laundry room. I have games out in the garage and in the attic that I need to sell. As we're going to take a look at in the future, I've got games coming in and I have no idea where I'm going to put them. I need to go through my collection and call my collection quite a bit. And that's going to be hard because I'm getting down to just the games that I really do like. There are a few things on my shelf that I don't like. But um, yeah, that's going to be, it's going to be, uh, I think, yeah, I think we're going to start seeing fewer big Kickstarters and just people are a little bit more careful with how they're spending their money and time these days, I think. As far as the games go, I do think the games are progressively getting um, maybe better. Things are getting more interesting as, as time goes by. Gaming is a it is an industry designing a game is a is an art is a, is a skill, a science that builds upon its predecessors. And that can be in a number of different ways, whether people are paying homage to the things they loved, to their uh, nostalgia, or they're looking at things in their past games. They're looking at their nostalgia and figuring out things they want to change. Um, you know, we're kind of in this place where, you know, in the last few years, people have been designing these kinds of dungeon crawl games who are maybe from the era of being influenced by the old school, being influenced by Warhammer Quest and the old GW games, maybe the first few fantasy flight games, but eventually we're going to get to that point where the people designing dungeon crawls have been more influenced by modern games like uh, Gloomhaven. 
And so you're going to see an evolving design sensibility, I think, as the games that people look back on fondly with nostalgia, the games that fueled their love to design games, as those people change and grow older and they become the core group of designers. It'll be an interesting thing, you know, as, as the torches are passed by people like Jerry Hawthorne or uh, James Hewitt, you know, people who grew up with Hero Quest and Warhammer Quest, they're passing the torch on to people who grew up with Gloomhaven. So it'll be an interesting to see how that changes. So yeah, hope I and I hope I answered your questions there, satisfactory. Um, that was a lot of fun. I'm looking forward to answering more Patreon questions. Okay, so now let's uh, now let's look forward. So one of the first things I want to do is looking forward to just a really quick look into the near future Crystal Ball, uh, the games that we're going to be covering soon on the channel. One of those games is under my table right now. It's in a big box. And that is a preview of a game that's going to be hitting Kickstarter in March. And that game has been hitting the circuit recently, and that is League of Dungeoneers. Um, so we're going to be taking a look at that in some capacity. I'm not sure what. Um, another game that uh, Deborah on the Geek um, Gamers, she just covered. So we're going to be covering that soon, is uh, Marching Order. A little kind of solo RPG dungeon crawl that is... I think highly um, influenced by uh, Darkest Dungeon, the um, the video game. Um, another thing we're going to be taking a look at soon is the Solitary Defilement Solo Supplement for Merkborg, the crazy kind of heavy metal, black metal looking um, RPG. So really looking forward to... Uh, getting into these supplements, which all look very, very interesting. Um, another preview game is this game here, Arcadia Tenebra. This game, I think, had a failed Kickstarter not too long ago. It's a very interesting game. I am struggling with the rules a little bit, but I do want to do a video on it because I think it's doing some really interesting and different things in the realm of heavily story-based uh, gaming. Uh, what else are we going to... Okay, so um, moving away from games, looking forward to the Sword and Sorcery Saga. Um, the book I'm reading right now, and I should have a review soon. This will probably be the first review, uh, book review of 2022. And that is Frost, Flower, and Thorn from Phyllis Ann Carr. I am loving this book right now. I cannot wait to talk to uh, more people about Frost, Flower, and Thorn. A very kind. Our first uh, book in this series that is written um, by a woman, and it is very much a strong. Like it's not just a gender swap. It is the characters Frost, Flower, and Thorn being women is a very integral part of the narrative, and they are awesome characters. And the big sword and sorcery project that we are going to be working on in 2022 is um, reviews for what is currently my favorite work of sword and sorcery and that is the elric saga and we're going to be doing a video for each of the books in the uh, saga there really looking forward to that i have my collector daw first editions first printing copies of those and then i also have my ace versions for my my reading uh <laughs> my reading copies because those old daws even though they're in pretty close to mint condition you know just opening those old paperbacks every time you do it there's a chance of like loosening the glue that will also include a review for this art book for uh james cawthorn the man and his art he was instrumental in the um, kind of the artistic depictions of Elric and that will also include this short story collection which does have an Elric story written by Carl Edward Wagner where Elric um, meets up with Cain so that should be uh, pretty interesting um, another uh, looking forward so uh, a little bit of personal uh, news here so I am switching jobs 
Uh, this is, for the first time in nearly 20 years, I'm switching, I'm starting a new job in two days. It is a huge life change. I have done basically the same thing every day for 17 years at my job. Um, 20, when COVID hit and we started working from home, my work life invaded my hobby life because this room now doubled or did double for two years as my work office and I hated it. Um, it became my, my, my den of fun and escapism became a place of stress and strife and it was very mentally taxing, mentally exhausting. So I am trading in my posh white collar desk job for a blue collar dirty job. Uh, my first job in kind of manual labor. Uh, it's going to be it's going to be very interesting. It's going to be an interesting uh, life change. And uh, I'm looking forward to I'm looking forward to being physically tired rather than mentally exhausted. I haven't been tired from a day of work in a very, very long time. And it's very hard to shut off my brain when I'm constantly thinking about work. And when work is in this room, it makes things very difficult. And so I'm hoping it's a good change. I'm not under the delusion that my new job is not going to have its own series of stresses and strifes. Uh, all jobs do, but I'm hoping it's a different set that I can cope with better. And so um, another big part of that change, though, is I'm also taking like a 50 percent pay cut for a year, maybe two years. It's going to be it's going to be uh, pretty rough. So I again want to say thank you to the dungeon dive patrons for uh helping support the channel and now it's kind of like even more important than ever so if you can support please please do um and if you can't support the channel uh financially please support it with um subscriptions and upvotes and shares you know i don't talk about this stuff very often maybe a few times a year i don't like constantly bringing it up but it is the only way really that I am going to have um, any kind of financial ability for a long time to invest into new games from this moment on until uh, things start moving up a little bit. And speaking of that, let's um, now move into um, games to be delivered. So these are games that I have already paid for on Kickstarter and they are still to be delivered and so this is another look ahead of games that we will probably be covering in the next uh, one to two years hopefully and there are a lot of them i'm going to go through the list and then i'm going to break out my top five okay so let's see here we have ever rain yeah right the never came i think uh, and that's that's never coming right uh forgotten depths the uh, Dungeon Universe Solace expansion, Machina Arcana expansions, Massive Darkness 2, Oathsworn, Dawn Shade, Hell, Adventures in Neverland, Stars of Icarus, Cryptic Explorers, Carnival Zombie, Mapmaker Adventures, Darker, uh, Darkest Dungeon, Bard Sung, Xeria, Col um, Colossal, nope, that came, uh, Down to Hell, I doubt that is ever getting delivered, uh, Tales from the Red Dragon Inn, Dungeon, Dungeons of Drogmore, uh, the New Hexplorate, which I'll mention in a bit in a bit with its full name, so I don't have that written here. Uh, Dungeons of Infinity, Second Edition, Kinless, the Morkborg solo game, uh, Telamore, um, Aridia, the Paths We Dare Tread, Valor and Villainy, Space Kraken, Iron Sworn, Starforge. Storm Weavers, Tiny Epic Dungeons, and Korra Quest. So those are all the games I've already paid for and the games I'm expecting in the next year or so. Of those, the top five that I am looking forward to are number five, Iron Sworn Starforge. I'm really looking forward to finally being able to play the Starforge. And I also ordered the physical versions of Iron Sworn at that time. 
So I'm really look, I, I, I really want to dive into Iron Sworn, and that's going to be a really good opportunity to do so. Number four is um, the new Hexplorit. And let's see, what was that called? Hexplorit is the domain of Mirza Noctis. And I'm really looking forward to that. And we're going to talk a little bit more about why in just a minute there. Uh, let's see. Number three was the Kinless, the Morkborg Solo RPG. I think that looks really interesting. It's a whole kind of box set that has all kinds of cool stuff to help the solo RPG -er get into the game. And, uh, fine, and up next is, uh, so this is number two, is Machina Arcana 2nd Edition. I cannot wait for this. I have a really good feeling that Machina Arcana will be eventually making its way onto my top 10. And I think Jirai, I think he finally nailed it with this third edition. And I'm really looking forward to the new expansions written by friend of the channel, Andy Lennon. So Andy, I'm fingers crossed that that gets <laughs> delivered soon, buddy. And uh, the, the number one game I'm looking forward to, and I really, I don't expect this for like two or three years, to be honest, and that is Aradia, The Paths We Dare Tread. That game just looks absolutely audacious and just completely epic and so much ambition. And I'm hoping that it, I'm hoping it's like half as good as the ambition. <laughs> so we'll see. So fingers crossed. All right, so we are now to the final part of this video, and that is kind of a, a, a best of, uh, maybe a worst of type thing. So uh, biggest disappointment of the year, and I don't mean just a game that came out in 2021, but this game I think came out in 2020, and I tried to play it again in 2021, and it just didn't do it for me. I'm disappointed in the game, but it's not a bad game. And that is Hexplorit Sands of Shurax. You know, my journey with Hexplorit started me not caring about the series at all to with Forest of Adramon and Valley of the Dead King to me just loving the games. I was so looking forward to Sands of Shurax. It looked amazing. I thought all of the systems added were going to just be this great, incredible experience. And it ended up just kind of, for me, collapsing under its own weight. I just, I can never grasp it. There was too many win conditions, too many different win conditions. I never knew when to commit to one. There was all these competing systems. I was constantly forgetting rules. It just, it was too much. And so one of the reasons why I am so looking forward to the new one is the company released this chart about their complexity and, and like thematic qualities. And Sands of Shrux was listed like super high com in complexity and uh, Valley of the Dead King was the lowest and the new one is just right above Valley of the Dead King so I think they're kind of like stripping back a lot of the systems from Sands of Shurax and focusing more on the things that make the other two games appealing to me and that is that kind of really immersive open world gameplay. Another big disappointment was Siege of the Citadel that finally delivered I think in 2021 maybe late 2020 but man, talk about a waste of space. That game is sitting out in my garage. It is like five huge boxes. It's one of those stupid Kickstarters that comes with a thousand expansions already baked into the game. And there's almost nothing to that game except for plastic bloat. It's just, it's so big and unwieldy. And the game itself just isn't very interesting. And it's not worth the time and the space. And Finally, for disappointments was this little box here, which I will be doing a video on just because I think it's cool to see. And that is Conan, the Tower of the Elephant. This little box crams a ton of high, super high quality components into it. And I, when I was unpacking, I thought, oh my God, this game is going to be amazing. But the rules, I could not even begin to penetrate the rules. And I know that people on BGG have been having some issues with it. And it was a pretty big disappointment. <clears throat> Excuse me. So, disappointments out of the way. Finally, here we go. The top five games of, uh, that I played in 2021. And this is not the games that were released in 2021, but games that I played. So, okay, starting at number five here, we have... Scarlet Heroes, the solo RPG from Kevin Crawford. 
This is probably my favorite RPG system now. It is the RPG system that most faithfully recreates the kinds of sword and sorcery stories I like. And those are stories that focus on a single hero. This game is designed and scaled from the ground up to be one GM and one player or solo. And it works so well. It's so simple, it's fast, it is all about that action. It makes you feel like a super heroic character. Not heroic in a good guy, but in heroic and you are doing things that normal people can't do. And that's what all of these sword and sorcery stories are about. I don't think that DCC RPG emulates sword and sorcery fiction very well because your characters are so squishy in that. And there are so many rules and so many things to get in the way of the adventure and the that is the exact opposite is true with Scarlet Heroes. And it's so easy to adapt to other OSR systems or use other OSR things in Scarlet Heroes. Yeah, fantastic. I'm so glad that I discovered that game this year. Um, next up, at number four is the D100 Dungeon World Builder expansion. Uh, I already liked D100 Dungeon, but with the World Builder expansion, it is um, elevated super high in my estimation one of the best expansions i've ever played it completely changes the game it makes the game better in almost every way it does add a lot of bookkeeping but if you don't mind that uh yeah this game is fantastic for that this is from martin knight solo published you are um, self-published you can get it on drive through rpg in a hardback paperback or pdf form i highly recommend just getting book six and book one with those two things together, you will have so many hours of pure overland and dungeon crawling. So very, very good. Uh, what's up next? So number three is um, one of our small box games and one of our game crafter games. And that is from 2020. And Scarlet Heroes was from 2015. D100 Dungeon, World Builder 2021, Rogue Dungeon 2020. The game, the solo small box card based dungeon crawl game that for me feels the most like a big dungeon crawl experience. This game does so much with so little. It gives you that feeling it's difficult. It, there's a lot of luck, but there are ways to mitigate their luck and there are ways to win. I'm really hoping to see this game in a new kind of maybe just just a new version maybe a kickstarter version this i think would be a perfect game for a couple little expansions that just add a little more variety and uh next up is from another game from 2015 and that is of course peter jenks quest for the lost pixel perhaps the game of the year um this game, it's funny, this game is about seven, six years old, and it's probably had more talk this year than uh, it has in that, that entire <laughs> in that entire time. It kind of became the game of the dungeon dive. I mean, it's all anybody was talking about on the Facebook group for a long time. A lot of people bought it. Um, I'm glad Peter Jenks saw some more success. It's a very expensive game because again, it's from Game Crafter, it's print on demand. But once you get all the expansions, you know, you're, you, you just have so much variety, so much pure dungeon crawling excitement in this big, heavy box full of thousands of cards. Uh, just what a fun, fun, easy, simple game, all about going in the dungeons, fighting monsters, getting better loot, rinse, repeat. You know, it's like the basics. It, it, it's, it's the very, it's the most reductionist dungeon crawl around super super great game and number one of course probably not a surprise but that is from red raven games and ryan lockett and that is sleeping gods sleeping gods is a masterpiece sleeping gods is the bellwether by which i will judge all campaign games going forward and the reason for that is the campaign is completely manageable and finishable. Finishable, is that a word? I've actually played through the campaign twice. 
I plan on playing it through many more times because there are still things to discover. Um, these big, large campaign games just seem to get in the way of themselves more often because they take so long to get through. You can get through a campaign, a whole campaign of Sleeping Gods in about 15 hours. That's fantastic. And you only see a small fraction of that every time you go through it. So you could have a satisfactory completion of the game in 15 hours, or you can continue to revisit it over the years and experience more of that campaign. It is also the bellwether by which I will judge all narrative story focus based games because one the paragraphs you read are actually well written which is pretty rare in the hobby two they are short and concise you don't have to read tons and tons and tons of pages there aren't multiple 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 minutes in between turns or um, to start a session you don't need to read like 20 pages like you would in Madara and you don't need to read multiple pages like you would in um, Chronicles of Junagor of not so well written prose. Um, Sleeping Gods has that perfect balance in every single thing it does. It has incredible art. The sense of adventure is just absolutely overwhelming. It truly is an open world game where you start and you have no idea where to go. You just set off in a direction and see what you can see, discover what you can discover. Um, the combat is unique and interesting. The characters are interesting. Yeah, just everything about Sleeping Gods is top notch quality. Um, you know, if I had to right now, it would be peak yeah, number one adventure game uh, sleeping gods it is it, it is just it is a very very special game and it really kind of encapsulates and and distills everything i love about this hobby into a single box of manageable content that is super super fun so all right well hey that was a long one that was a look back at 2021 we discussed some Patreon stuff um, and a little look forward to 2022. Here's uh, to another good year at the Dungeon Dive. And I hope you guys enjoy my content that I have uh, produced for you in the last year. And I hope you're looking forward to the new things that are coming in 2022. So, all right, take it easy, guys. We'll talk to you later. Bye-bye.